Well, good morning, Southside Bible Church. Welcome to any guests who are visiting with us for the first time. We are grateful to have you with us, and, and we, we believe that preaching is the continuing of worship, that we worship God through the proclaimed word, and so we are grateful um, that you are with us for this time now. Um, very special greeting to the saints at Southside Bible Church whose health has kept you from being here and just want you to know our love for you and, and how missed you guys are and continue to be prayed for, I know, weekly uh, as the elders lift you up in all of your health battles and struggles. Um, it was mentioned about Josh Jackson's service will be here on Saturday, and I want you to be praying for John and Kim. John, can you raise your hand wherever you're at? Hey, water. Where are you at? There, oh, there he is. Just guys, keep praying for my dear brother as we're going to have the memorial service for his son uh, this Saturday. And I just, let's keep praying for our dear brother and sister. This morning we're going to be studying in the book of Romans, if you'll turn to chapter 8 again. We, we pulled out during the Christmas season, took a little break, and I've been exhorted by some of the saints that pulling out of Romans is the unpardonable sin. So that has been duly noted for next year. Um, we'll probably still be in Romans next year, so you're safe. Uh, we're in this beautiful section of Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. I'm calling it the five unanswerable questions as Paul finishes out this major section in his epistle. It's the conclusion and application of the first eight chapters of Romans. And so in talking with several of you this week, I want to make sure that you get the fullness of what's happening right now in this section because I think it's imperative to our Christian life and our growth in Christ. So I want to talk about the, the word uh, sanctification. Sanctification, uh, we're looking at what's called progressive sanctification. So when you're saved, you're initially sanctified and set apart uh, for God, and this ultimate sanctification is when you're going to be made perfect in glory. And now progressive is we're trying to now grow in conformity to Jesus Christ day by day as children of God. Too many times when we come to sanctification, we, it's just go work hard at this. God, God wants us to live this way, and at first we kill it. I, I've said this before, you, don't, you no longer smoke, drink, or chew, or go with girls who do, and you're like, I'm growing like a weed. And as we progress, you start seeing the depth of pride, self, how much you really want approval, your self-image, these over-desires called epithumias, and, and you just think the Christian life is if I focus on sanctification, so many times we'll slip into a legalism, and Paul said, don't be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Don't put yourself back under the law now in your sanctification. So Paul's been laboring very carefully and strategically to teach us how all of this works. And what we've learned is our indicatives are statements of facts, what God has done in the gospel. And that's been Romans 1 through 8. God has accomplished salvation, and the imperatives are therefore as children of God. Now go live like it. Go live what he's done for you and the freedom and go serve the king of kings. So therefore is the, the word that ties us all together. And then Romans 8, 29 through 30, those whom he foreknew... He also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. And there's one thing missing in that. What, would you, what do you see kind of missing? I hope it's the word we're talking about, sanctification, right? It doesn't even mention sanctification. So, that's what I want to try to draw out a little bit then this morning, is I see that those who have been justified, he glorified. So that's the beginning of our sanctification. Glorification is he's, he's moving us from one degree of glory to the next. And so that's all of our sanctification ultimately ending up in perfection. But I think there's more than just that. I believe that justification and glorification are the two boundaries that we are to live our lives in. They're, they're both anchored on the two comings of Jesus Christ, his first and second advent. 
We're told in this whole epistle when it began, the just shall live by faith. We're to, we're to live by faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we've been trying to learn the obedience of faith, this faith that beholds these things and begins to follow and obey God. Luther said the whole gospel stands or falls on justification. And, and this, this is what we've been seeing here is justification leads to what? And what I just read, glorification. It, it's, it's what's going to make us holy men and women and children. It's the assurance of our glorification that spurs us on in our sanctification. And so uh, Romans 1 through 8 has been showing us those two things, that you're justified in Romans 8, you're going to be glorified. It's certain. God's going to do it. He's there, he can put it in the past tense as if it's already done. And those two things are what will lead to holy living. And Paul said holy living in Romans 6, 11 is reckoning these things to be true. Live in light of these things to bring about the obedience of faith. And so as we hit this section, I saw two problems that keep us then from living holy lives. Our depravity is that we love sin more than God. That's got to be fixed if you're ever going to grow. And then I need a greater power than guilt and shame. I'm not right with God, and I, I need that to be fixed. And so I see Paul, he spends five chapters on justification. That's where it has to begin in the gospel. You can't remove your guilt, and thus you can't live for God until that is dealt with. You just can't decide, I'm going to start going to church. I'm going to start reading my Bible and be a good person. You might be sitting here trying to do that this morning. That is not the starting point for Christianity. That will abort an eternal destruction. Justification is where it begins. And it's this gospel that God has sent his son into the world to do everything necessary to be in the presence of God again. Free grace. It's without cost, without money, without merit. Well, won't people just abuse this? And that's where we moved into Romans 6. Won't they just sin that grace might abound? And Romans 6 through 7, I want you to catch this. It's not a treatise on sanctification, but it's taking on the antagonist to justification. If, if grace is this free, you, you're just going to go live any way you want. And Paul's point is, yes, <laughs> you're going to be so changed that you will go live the way you want. Justification takes down these problems to live holy. You're regenerated, you're given a new nature, it's not done in a vacuum, it's done with truth in the heart, the truth of what God in Christ has done for you. He gives you new desires, he gives you a heart of flesh. He says, now you love the law because you love the lawgiver. You died to sin and you're now alive to God. You have a new master, a doulos of Christ. You've been married to Christ and you're not under law any longer, but you're under grace. That's everything we've been studying. And so what I see in chapter 8, then, is the eternal security. We will be glorified if you've been called and justified. So if you have faith in Christ, you will be glorified. And, and we've been predestined to it, is what we saw in Romans 8, 29 through 30. It will come to pass. And so the beauty of what I see at the cross is the salvation that will absolutely end in glorification for the believer. If justified, you will be glorified, and sanctification is a given. It will take place by the power of God. And so I'm saved with an eye for what I've been saved for. I've been saved for glory. I'm not a citizen of this world. I'm an alien and sojourner, and I'm waiting patiently for glory. And this is what John said in 1 John 3. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us. Why? Because it did not know Him, Christ. Beloved, now we are children of God, and has not appeared as yet what we shall be, glorification. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him just as He is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies himself just as he is pure. And so the way we're going to grow in holiness is this hope, the certainty that we're going to see him and be with him. And I believe this hope of glorification is what purifies 
his people. It makes us separate from sin and pure. I don't have to go grab this world and get everything now because I, I, Paul said, I, I don't count the present sufferings worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed. I don't have to have the perfect life now. I don't have to have everything. I, I've got this hope set on glory. And as I do, it's going to purify me. It's going to set me free from this world. And so I must live into that. And so when is the last time you heard justification and glorification preached at a holiness seminar? Very rare. So let me bring my point to a head, because some of you, I can tell you're already falling asleep. This matters so much to me, I want you to get it. I've seen many people trying to live the Christian life just looking at sanctification. I'm going to do it. I'm going to be better. I'm going to work harder for God. And you're just sitting here spinning your wheels. And you don't long for glorification because spinning your wheels is making you think, I'm not going to get to glorification. And you're very caught up in sanctification and it becomes very external. You're getting all the externals down, but nothing of the heart. You don't know anything of Samuel Rutherford who said, my greatest burden is that I got to love Christ at such a distance. (laughs) Come, come back today. Very little crying, Maranatha. I I just, everyone's saying, I want to put my tent stakes down. Not come back, Jesus, let it be today. Today could be my glorification. So the hymn writer said, at the cross, at the cross, when I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away, it was there by faith I received my sight and now I'm happy all the day. This is the most sanctifying thing there is. It's automatic. You will grow in your uh, understanding of justification, what God has done in Christ. Then you will long more for glory. You'll, You'll love this God more and more and I just want to be with him. And you'll be more and more holy in those two foundation stones. You'll just keep longing for holiness and more conformity, knowing, look what he did to save me, and look what's coming in glory. I have everything. Everything's been fixed in Romans. And this is how we're going to grow. <coughs> Who brought this up? I forgot. Oh, Sweezy, I love you, brother. I don't think I would have made it without that, Jay. <clears throat> so that's what happens. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. What does this salvation do? It instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. That's holiness. That's sanctification. This grace that came will cause us to be those kind of people looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, looking for the second coming who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people of his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Justification. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Get in your face and keep telling you these things and wrestle with you every week. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to close out. You ready? Then I'm going to start our sermon. Martin Lloyd-Jones that I'm going to close out? Is the amen that I'm going to stop? Thank you, brother. Oh, okay. I haven't done a long introduction for a long time, so this feels good. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he said, the way to preach holiness, catch this, is not to preach about me and my feelings and to propound various theories as to how I can be delivered. It is rather to preach justification and glorification. By so doing, you will include sanctification. Such is the apostle's method, Paul, whom he justified, these he also glorified. It is because certain people do not know the truth about justification and glorification as they ought that they are defective in their teaching about sanctification. A man who has his eye on his future state of glorification will spend his time in preparing himself for it. I just want to be fit. For glory. So if you're visiting, those terms probably are so foreign to you. I want you to come up to me afterwards and I'll take time to explain what every one of those things mean. And if you've been here for the whole Romans, you're saying, Pastor, get on with it, brother. So get this. This is why I'm going here. Romans 8, 31 through 39 is taking those two truths, justification and glorification, and it's showing you how to go into battle how to fight for your hope and your joy and your holiness. 
These truths have to be ironed out in your heart and your mind again and again. You can't just have them in your noggin. You've got to get them into your heart. You've got to reckon them into your heart where you love these, you live upon them. Every trial that comes at you, your first thought, I go there. I would say daily you must live into these truths. And what you get is what I said to my community group on Tuesday night. I think the root of every sin is not believing the first question if God is for us. And I just when you don't get that, that's the root of every sin. Because if God's not for me, I got to take over and control. I got to get more from the world. If you could just sit here in the fullness of this gospel, God is for us. Oh, what that would do to the people of God and producing holiness and trust and longing for him. So, let's pray. Father, long-winded introduction, but for a purpose. I pray if these brothers and sisters get anything, it's that our holiness is going to spring from a God who has declared us not guilty, a God who's coming again to make all things right, all things perfect in the presence of the new heavens and the new earth, seeing Jesus by sight. Lord, the church has quit believing those things. They've quit looking to those things, and they're looking to methods and external ways to, to grow. God, these are the foundation stones that are going to make us into the image of Jesus Christ. And so I pray that every soul in here anchors on these truths, these great two realities of why Jesus came into this world to save us and why he's coming again to make us perfect. So God, thank you for this gospel and let everyone in this room treasure these gifts by faith, live into them and know how to wrestle and fight with the devil of the world in our own flesh. God, meet us here this morning now as we open the word of God to what I think could be one of the most beautiful freeing verses in all of the Bible. Lord, would you meet us? and do for each person individually what they need before their God. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Romans 8, 31, the first question, if God is for us, who could be against us? Who could ever harm God's purposes and what he's doing? So what we saw last week is there's a lot of people against us. And everything against us that comes daily is God's instrument to cut flesh off your heart and sanctify you and grow you. What this could do to the child of God, that I have nothing to fear God for us. And everything, nothing can ever stop or harm what God is doing in my life. That is the definition of freedom. Question number two, if, since, God did not spare his own son, but delivered him up, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? He did the hard thing in not sparing his own son on Calvary. How will he not give us the things that we need to journey to glory? Third question. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. <clears throat> Let's start with who will bring a charge against God's elect. God's elect? Do you know who you're bringing charges against? <laughs> You're charging those whom God's working all things for good, and he foreknew, he set his love on you before the foundation of the world. He predestined you to be conformed to his son. He justified you. He's going to glorify you. That's who you're bringing charges against. He set his affection upon us in eternity past. He's taken an interest. He chose us. His affection is upon you, child of God. I love when Peter writes 1 Peter when they're being persecuted by Nero. You might not be the choice of the world, but Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are chosen. You're not chosen by the world, but you are the choice of Almighty God. Luke 18, 7, Jesus said, Now shall not God bring about justice for his elect, who cry to him day and night, will he delay long over them? And they're his chosen ones, his favored ones. Is that how you think of yourself? Chosen of God. <laughs> who can bring a charge against God's chosen ones? I'm the object of his love. I'm the object of his blessing. I'm the apple of his eye. Paul doesn't shy, shy away from this phrase, the elect of God. 
He drinks it up for all of its truth and blessing and the transforming power it brings into our lives when you know you are loved by God and he set it on you, not based on anything in you, but his own choice, and you can never do anything to lose it. We're going to see that next week. Nothing can separate you from it. So here's the question. <clears throat> Who shall bring a charge against God's special people? Can anyone bring a charge against God's favored one that can bring them into disfavor? Can anything be brought that will stick to your account, that could change the verdict from heaven that said not guilty to, no, you are guilty? Can anyone bring a charge against God's elect? So what is going on in this third question? The answer is the same as the first question, who could be against us? The answer is no one. But here, the same answer. Who can bring a charge against God's elect? No one. What was true at the first question, that doesn't make sense to me. There's so many against me. We learned that, that no one can come against us except God's purposes. And so my question is simple. Can anyone bring a charge against you? And for me, I find this on a daily occurrence. Paul is staying true to form. He brings us now into a law court. And he always uses legal terms when he talks about this term justification. And he's saying, who can come forward as an accuser of God's elect? Who can come into this courtroom and bring a charge against you that can be substantiated, substantial evidence? And this word, bring a charge, it's used four times in the New Testament. I'm just going to read two times. In Acts 23, 29, I found him to be accused over questions. This is about Paul, Claudius, talking to Felix over about their law, but under no accusation deserving death or imprisonment. He's being accused. Acts 26, 2, in regard to all the things of which I, Paul says, I am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I'm about to make my defense before you today. This word carries the idea of bringing a legal charge against someone. Who can come forward and accuse the people of God in the courtroom? And, and, and I sit and I wrestle with, what's, what's Satan's name? You know, he's, he's the accuser of the brethren. So can anyone bring a charge? That's what Satan's called. He goes around bringing charges all day long against us. Revelation 12, 10, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down who accuses them before our God day and night. He's always accusing us to God <coughs> and he's accusing us to us and he accuses us to others. He's a slanderer. And he's an accuser. Job 1, he accused that Job only served God because he's pampered and protected. Take away his pampering and all his protections and he'll curse you. There is a real devil accusing me often and frequently. So how does that tie into this passage? And how about the world? The world will often accuse and lay charges at your feet. They, they love the word, what is it? Hypocrite. They're just waiting to pounce on you and throw it at you, sometimes for being righteous and sometimes for being unrighteous. Look at your inconsistencies. Look at your failures. You're a, you're a joke. Acts 6.14, they're stoning Stephen, and it says the false accusers come forth. And so the world will accuse you daily as well. And then I'm thinking about my own conscience can accuse us, can it? Our conscience will accuse us. It will take the truth that we've been trained with and it accuses us or defends us. We learned that in our Sunday school uh, for seven weeks. Praise God for a conscience. This is a gift from God. It was pre fall It was designed for our good and it, it accuses. And I think of the Old Testament sacrifices where it said it could not truly cleanse our conscience, but uh, just a reminder of sin. And so many live with the gnawing of a guilty conscience. And so the answer to this question seems not true or very distant for you. I have a lot of charges in my own mind. My mind is accusing me day and night. 
Romans 7 we studied, uh, my take on it was indwelling sin. And, and here's all this indwelling sin accusing me. And Romans 8, 1 says, therefore, in light of this battle with the flesh, that there's now, right now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so here's my, my battle with my own flesh telling me, you're, 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 not, you're not good enough. You're evil. You're, you can't be God's elect. And number five, probably the greatest, is we, we all know we live before an all-knowing God. It says our hearts will be laid open and our secret sins are before his eyes. And this is what got Luther. He said, how can I stand before a holy God in judgment? And the wisdom of his day said, by your own works and merit. So the enemy uses this thought to accuse the brethren. God, God sees my heart and my life, and it, it accuses you uh, day and night. And so this morning, I, I look at this question and say, who can bring a charge against God's elect? And I answer, way too many people, and the fallen angels, and my own heart. I, I live in charges echoing in my head. And as a pastor, I can tell you this boldly and confidently this morning, we are on the roots of deep battles and struggles in the Christian life right here. So many live in guilt and deal with it wrongly. I think our whole country is built how to get rid of guilt wrongly, and we merge it with Christianity. We have accusers when no one's accusing we live in a courtroom in our head all day long listening to the different accusers laying it to your account. And you, you can't get free. You grew up in homes with parents who accused you day and night. Charge after charge. I counsel this a lot. You're lazy. You'll never amount to anything. I wonder if you're even a Christian and, and that's used as a baseball bat Hold out every time you step out of line instead of a healthy 1 Corinthians 13 to test yourself and examine yourself. If you could just be more like your brother or sister, you know the drill. Encouraging words in those kind of homes are, are very few and sparse. And most words are harsh and tearing down, and you still hear, hear those words every day of your life. If someone tells you something negative, your parents' words are echoing in your head. For some of you, it happened at school among your peers. It's hard to go to school. You slowly learned that you're not the son and everything revolves around you. You know, my sweet little mom told me I was the best thing ever and I went into the world and they didn't say the same thing. <laughs> right, mom? <laughs> mean things were said to you. Maybe you were the last one picked for the, the team, the kickball team at recess. Maybe you were bullied. Maybe you were never asked out on a date, and that hurts. Maybe you were made fun of. I, your, your teeth, your chin, your ears. Your no you ever met anyone who likes their nose? Your, the, probably the hardest state of teenagers was your, your pimples. And these charges from your peers just stick to you like glue. And if that isn't enough, you're beat up daily with the accusation from your own self-indictments. You beat yourself and you accuse yourself daily. You, you just live in self-accusation. I'm a bum, and I know it, but I, I, I can't admit it, so I got to put a little facade on. And then the church is supposed to, <laughs> they, they, they work to increase guilt and make you feel worse as a failure as a Christian. Sunday after Sunday, law condemnation, walk aisles to get the guilt off, and it doesn't work. It's just like the Old Testament sacrifices. Some of you have told me the book of the Bible is a book of condemnation instead of the most beautiful love letter ever written of the grace of God who loves me infinitely in Christ. And there's all these things just accusing you day in and day out. And you hear a verse like this, who can bring a charge against God's elect? And you're like, oh, let me give you a list. Day and night, the charges are made against me. They echo in my head as I lay down on my pillow. Sleep comes hard for me because all the accusations start when I go to bed. I replay in my mind the dumb things that I said, how I must have looked when I did that, and I, I live in this. 
So I want you to hear something life-giving this morning. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said it's the gospel of God. There's a cure for that. Becoming your own defense lawyer is not the answer. And many of you are trying to fix it with that. You don't have to live this way the rest of your life. You don't have to fight in the body of Christ if you feel someone is accusing you. You don't have to run from everyone you think might be bringing a charge. To live in fear as you walk into the body of Christ because you can't handle any more rejection or charges. And though I fight with you, when my head goes on the pillow, I know it's me and I want it to stop the cry of my heart. And so will you join with me, Church of God? I have met too many who live this way their entire lives. And I want you to hear this. I believe this with your whole heart. It can come to an end this morning. If you've done this for 40 years, it could end today. And the answer to this must be embraced by faith. The gospel of Jesus Christ treasured in your heart is the place where all these accusations are quieted. I always love that picture of Christ on the boat, and he goes, shh, and the waves just go like that. That's what could happen this morning with all these accusations that you're living with. Not guilty. Not guilty. No one can bring a charge against you that will ever stick. And the reason I say that is a simple answer. Who can bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Here's your answer. It's God who justifies us. And this is so good because I ever think Paul could have just said, no, you're justified. And that would be an amazing answer. But what does he, what does he really say? He, he makes something very intensive in this statement. God is the one who justifies. That's the focus. And here's your healing this morning. It's God who says, not guilty. If I say it, who gives a rip? One thing I learned during COVID, as I was watching the court system closely, one court would say something, the next court with more jurisdiction or authority would say another, and you just kept waiting for really important decisions. Lord, get it to the Supreme Court so we can get an edict and we can bank on something instead of it changing every week. It can go no higher once we get to Supreme Court. And it was like, okay, finally, we have a decision now. We can live it. That did something for me. I loved it. And I think that that is what Paul wants to blow your mind with this morning. Who justified you? God. It can't go any higher. No other courts. That is the supreme of supreme courts. God justified you. Just picture the way it goes in a courtroom. You go into a law court. The defense goes, and you listen to the defense, and they're so gifted, and they're done. You're like, this case is over. I've sat on one of those before. But then the prosecution gets up and says, my learned friend here has forgotten a point in subsection 8.3, i.e., and, and convicts him. And it's like, he must be prosecuted. He, they didn't know about that little thing in, somewhere in the law. And some of us live with that. If God knew I was going to do that, he would have never justified me. If, if God knew what was in my heart this morning, no way. How many times have I spurned his love? We just, we've been seeing love just overflowing in Romans, and I, I, I grieve it, and I sin against the most amazing love. He, how can he justify me? The devil has so much uh, evidence to bring into court to get a mistrial. It's so easy. There's just so many good lawyers out there who can always find something to flip a case. There's just Perry Masons walking down the street everywhere. It can't happen in this law court. God is the judge and the lawgiver. He, he, he gave the law. 
You think there, anyone's going to bring something that he didn't know is in his law? Oh, you didn't know this. You missed this. Satan can never bring a forgotten clause or some hidden thing in the law that God didn't know about. He can't bring a charge against us that will ever stick. Why? Because God is the one who justifies. We are finished with the law's demands for our acceptance with God. We are dead to the law in the matter of condemnation. Romans 7, 4, Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law, to the body of Christ, that you might be joined to another Christ, to him who was raised from the dead, so that we might bear fruit for God. God regards me judicially as perfectly righteous and holy before his bench. So in regards to his law and legal matter, I'm perfect. I'm clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. (laughs) This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And so if God can't forgive me without being just to his law, it can't happen. And that was Romans 3. We spent that whole section that God can forgive and still be just because he punished his own son. And so the whole argument was called imputation. Our sins were imputed to Christ. He died on a cross for all of our transgressions. The righteousness that God required, he took from his perfect son who fulfilled it, and he puts that to my account so that now I stand before God justified. Righteous. Before him. I wonder how many of you have accusations going off in your head just as you look at that. This is justification, a judicial act by God in a moment of time. It's not a future tense. It's it's, it's done. The minute you believe, you're justified. I've said it before, the only religion that you begin justified, you don't work to get justified. Through Jesus Christ, he pronounces us righteous. God regards me as just. A once and forever proclamation that can never be changed, never turned, not guilty. I I Just get a shirt. I'm not into tattoos, but you can tattoo that right on your chest if you want. Get a shirt. Every day, not guilty. This is the glory of the gospel. And Paul says, who shall lay a charge against God's elect? Is there anything that can change our standing or our favor? Is there anything that can bring us back under condemnation of Romans 8.1? And I want you to hear the answer this morning, please. With your mind and your heart, no one. There's a Latin phrase, raise judicata. I probably butchered that, Florence. Are you here? Can you help me? How do you, do you know that term? I did it? Sweet. So I'm going to teach you something. Raise judicata. It means that a case has been fully dealt with. It can't be tried again. It's sealed. It's done. It can no longer be litigated. All parties, all evidence, all arguments have been heard. They've been settled. There can be no more trying this case. Raise judicata. The court is no longer in session. That's what Paul's saying here. It's done. Guys, we're, we're going to blow it, and we're going to sin, and we're going to be humbled, and we're going to confess sin and repent, but nothing can stick against us in the court of heaven that can make us guilty again or bring us under God's condemnation. Does anyone really believe this? That's the gospel. God just shows it from every angle to try to convince your mind and your heart this is the truth of God's Word. This is the fight of faith, brothers and sisters, to believe what God has said. Raise judicata. This can't be tried again. I got to quit living in this accusation, just living in it and dying in it. It's got to stop. Pray that you could see and drink this up this morning. You have an amazing answer to your accusers, your parents, the world, the church indwelling sin, your conscience, and the devil. Your answer is real simple. God himself has declared me not guilty. He's accepted me, he's adopted me, and he approves me. And he rejoices over me, and he really likes me. 
Nothing can be brought to him that can change the eternal verdict that God has made justified. Whose voice are you going to listen to? That's the question for every believer here this morning. Which voice are you going to keep listening to? I'm begging you. You have an answer to all these accusations that you let go in your head every day. It's to say, "Uh uh-uh. It's not true. Bring all charges and say all kinds of evil against me. God himself has justified me. I'm not even saying it's not true. The charges could be very true. But what I want you to see is God has justified you. That's the joy of my heart daily. He's declared me not guilty. And I want you to hear this. Psychology cannot do this for you. Psychology tries to redistribute the guilt, put it on something else. The famous thing today is to blame your parents. Psychology can do all these things to to try to get rid of guilt. But you know what God says? Your guilt is real, and there's a way to get rid of it. And it's by looking at this gospel where God declares you not guilty. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't run to anything else. Don't run to soap operas. Don't run to ice cream. There's a million false substitutes to get rid of my guilt. Don't run to friends. I, I am really nice, right? I'm a good person. You know, just we run to everything we possibly can to get rid of this guilt. Run to Christ. Not guilty. It'll change your life. This is what you need. Many accusations that you hear daily. Maybe some of you had a spouse who was so abusive and accusing and the narcissistic, I'm going to blame you for it. Or that boss who you can never please and they just always make you feel stupid. A teacher that made you feel like you were of no value because you weren't an A student. A conscience that tells you you're a bum. An evil one having a field day with all of this. This morning on this holy ground, I want you to put an end to it forever. There's one answer. Paul's teaching us how to fight. The answer, it's God who has justified you. The joy of our lives in eternity And until that breaks into your heart and embraced by faith, you're going to live a life of misery and slavery to sin. Can I share with you where it will take you? I've watched this too many times. This is is why I counsel instead of just sit up in an ivory tower. You come into a church because after all these accusations your whole life, these are the people who accept me. And then you get in and the confrontation and conflict begins. Teaching starts to make you feel guilty. Eventually, I'm going to go to another church where they don't get in my grill. I want one of those big ones where you walk in and nobody knows you and you sing some cool songs, you get a little smoke, and then you, you, you get a, some encouragement about stress and you get to walk out. That's what I need. And then that doesn't work. The accusations are still there. They're still coming. And so finally, like, all right, I'm just going to go into the world. The world doesn't judge me like Christians do. They don't care. And then I get into there, and I find out when it gets hard, they don't really care either. And then I, I start playing with some liberal views. And I'm just going to start moving in that direction. And Psalm 1 says when, when you walk with sinners and then you stand with them and then you're sitting with them and you're a scoffer, you're, you're with them now, you're joining their thinking. I'm telling you, I've watched this again and again and again. Some of you might be in that process this morning. It will end in misery because it doesn't remove your guilt. All these things you keep trying, go to Jesus, not guilty. There's a way to fix this, not with all that other slop. You don't want to die and be told you are guilty and the sentence will never change for all of eternity. Do not get a false declaration that you're not guilty when you are. Don't try to get rid of that some other false way. And so what I offer to you this morning is true 
freedom. I've said this before, I'm a bum. And I'm loved a million times more than I could have ever hoped or dreamed or imagined. I'm not guilty. God set his love on me in eternity past and it's going to go all the way to eternity future. I can't get over this. We're not guilty. Next week, we're going to take on condemning yourself and others condemning you. So I want to close out with just a couple points of application and, and we'll, we'll worship. I want you to drink this up first, believer. Justification. I need you to make it your absolutely certain hope. I, I can die on this truth of what Jesus did for me and it will make you holy. Die on this. Justified because of Christ. Stand assured. Battle the accusers with this doctrine. It's God who justifies. And when your conscience is doing it and others are doing it, whatever it is, it, here's how you fight. You got to fight. You got to say, no, no. I, you could even say, you're right, enemy. I am guilty. I did do that. But I'm, God justified me. It's no longer in my account. It's gone. It's as far as the east is from the west. He's accepted me. That's how you fight. You got to fight for this because there's accusers on every turn. And I've got to go to Christ and just fight for this truth. Then understand the difference between the Holy Spirit convicting you of sin and the devil accusing you. If the Holy Spirit, he'll say you told a lie and the Spirit will speak to your conscience and he'll show you, you need to repent. You sinned against God. He leads you to health. He leads you to God. He leads you to cleansing, to make it right with God and right with other people. That's how the Holy Spirit works. Very positive and very redeeming. The way the devil accuses, <clears throat> he might point out the same sin and oppress me and destroy me with guilt. How can you be a Christian? Surely you're going to be cast down on the last day. You told a lie. You've trampled God's court so many times with the same sin. Give up. Don't, don't you think enough is enough? Throw out your hope. Curse God and die. Quit. Stay away from God and stay away from people. That's what the devil will tell you. And here's where we got to stand and claim Romans 8.33. No, it's God who's justified me. And another thought, the accuser of the brethren let us not join hands with the devil and slander and gossip. They're so destructive. Let us just be committed as a church to fight against this heinous sin of being the accuser of the brethren. Don't join with the devil. Do you want to be his lackey? Goodness. This is beautiful. And this is my heart for you this morning as your pastor, one of your pastors. This can set you free, hear this, to love your accusers, to forgive them and to release them. You could actually be freed this morning of those who have been accusing you your whole life that you really there's a bitterness and there's an anger. You're holding it in. And when you get this gospel, you're free now to love those who have accused you your whole life and hurt you and brought you down and set evil against you. You literally could this morning be set free to love that one who's haunting you in your conscience this morning. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then lastly, whose approval are you really seeking? If that person accuses or doesn't approve you, you will be undone. Whose approval, disapproval do you fear the most? Here's the answer. Junior high kids, you don't have to walk around always living in fear. Do they like my clothes? Do they like my hairstyle? Older people, do they like my car, my place? Do they like my laugh? Do they like my... I know people who just live in that. This is freedom where you're not having to be stuck in the approval of men. Romans 2 says, this circumcised heart, your praise is not from men, but from God. This gospel sets you free. I don't have to have men's approval. I'm free from that. 
I got God's. And now I'm free to go love. God is for me. Who can bring a charge that will stick? Step into that freedom this morning. And I just pray for anyone who's coming here that is an unbeliever, you've never been saved. This is a gospel to set you free, that you could be declared not guilty. You could be declared righteous by the God of the universe because what his son did. He lived the life that you should have, and he died the death that you deserved. Would you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Believe this, and you'll be declared not guilty. You'll be justified, and you will be glorified. And hell itself can't pull you out of that hand once it justifies you. Let's pray. Father, this is so healing. There are so many amazing truths in here. And I pray if there's anyone in here who's been running to lies, running to false ways to get rid of guilt, Father, if there's any who are paralyzed because of all the false accusations that have come at them during their life, please, Lord, Holy Spirit, break the bonds right now. Let them look upon Jesus Christ dying in their place for their sin, rising again for their justification so they could be declared not guilty. Oh God, let them believe and be free from all this bondage and all this hurt that has owned them and defined them all of their days on this earth. There is a remedy that the world does not hold, but you hold. Please let all look upon Jesus. And believe this morning, I pray in the name of Christ.